I and they're getting drops now. You put in there. I saw that recently on commercial. Is that trial? Okay, looks like chapter nine is what we're up to. It's working. Again, appropriate. We are right here at uh, Passover, and we're going to do the last uh, few plagues today. Um, perhaps amongst other things, we'll see. We'll see if we can get through all ten. I think we're at you know plague six or seven, somewhere in the the middle, the middle innings of the plagues, or so in that middle time. Yeah, you know, it's going to be a little bit, a uh, little bit more trouble for Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think we're at the start of nine. Um, yeah, we're up to cattle. Uh, we can say our blessing, <coughs> excuse me, over the study of Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Asher Kitshan B'mitzvotav B'tivan Ba'as B'tivrei Torah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Uh let's start uh Rick. You want to give us uh, the beginnings here of nine. God said. God bless no wait. I'm looking at my Genesis. He's in state. Genesis. Like, See, he went on? back in time yeah. in chapter nine. Wrong chapter, Wrong chapter nine. Okay, there we go. Okay. Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go to worship me. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, then the hand of the Lord will strike your livestock in the fields, the horses, the asses, the camels, the cattle and the sheep, with a very severe pestilence. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of the Egyptians, so that nothing shall die of all that belongs to the Israelites. The Lord has fixed the time. Tomorrow, the Lord will do this thing in the land. Oh, so they're in trouble already, you know. But again, this came up last week. I think Karen, you had mentioned it last week about the idea of distinction. You know, and when the Torah yeah. makes it clear that this is only happening to the Egyptian one, and so here, here is an example where they, they do make the distinction pretty clear that all of the animals of the Israelites they'll be all right. But the poor uh, animals here of the Egyptians, the animals do no wrong, or do they? I don't know. But they're getting smacked around here, too. You know, those oppressive sheep. Uh, but they get the, the pestilence, obviously. It's, again, more for the Egyptian landowners and you know, herdsmen, all that other stuff. So, so their livestock would, uh, would die, you know, they get sick. And then, obviously, this is a blow to the uh, economy. I, I think it increases inflation, uh, mm. but with all the cattle, uh, you know, everything apparently increases inflation right now. So uh, this as well. So there we go with that. Uh, Ricky, me one more. And the Lord did so the next day. God keeps his promises. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but of the livestock of the Israelites, not a beast died. When the Pharaoh inquired, he found that not a head of the livestock of Israel had died. Yet Pharaoh remained stubborn, and he would not let the people go. Pharaoh is stubborn. Pharaoh is hard-hearted. Does not really get the lesson. You got to know when to hold them, and know when to fold them. No walk away. What's the next line? No when to hide. No. No. No when to run. No. No, no when to. Oh, <laughs> what, what, what's the next phrase there? We, we were at a loss. Uh, okay, well. <laughs> Nowhere to run. That would be our homework Nowhere next to hide. To learn. She said hide also. Yeah, in, yeah. We'll this figure it out. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, okay, so he doesn't let them go. I hasn't learned his lesson yet. And now we get to another plague, very unpleasant. Uh, Melissa, you want to give that a go? And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, each of you take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become a fine dust all over the land of Egypt and cause an inflammation breaking out in boils on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and appeared before Pharaoh. 
Moses threw it toward the sky and it caused an inflammation breaking up and boils on man and beast. So, you know, every time you read the Torah, you think about something new or different than last time around. So now all of a sudden I have this picture of Moses like LeBron James before a game. And two, because LeBron always takes the powder and <laughs> throws it up in the air. And now I'm thinking of Moses as LeBron James, which is an interesting image in and of itself. Uh, okay. How is it leaning uh, on so, beef? So, since all the beasts I'm, are dead. Say again, Karen. One how is it leaning on man and beast since we killed off all the beasts in the last plague? Ah, well, so I don't know if we killed all the beasts. I think we killed a lot of the beasts. But uh, oh. does it say all? I, I, I think a lot it of them. It doesn't say dogs like and cats, but it says everything else. I guess it's true. It, you know, it could be different kind of animals. You know, the elephants take a hit. Uh, oh, but there were no okay. elephants. But so, mm. uh, as, as far as I know, I don't think they had elephants in Egypt just yet. Um and I don't know how many um, how much horses were actually even domesticated at this point, but again, it's neither here nor there. It's going to happen later on when we have the horses. Uh, so, yeah. So now we have boils everywhere. Boils are unpleasant uh, to say the least. Everyone has inflammation, and it's not great. Uh, and so, unpleasant as well. So we're just pouring through the plague. So that was two in a row. Uh, and now we're going to get another one pretty uh, pretty darn soon. I'm going to give me one more. The magicians were unable to confront Moses because of the inflammation, for the inflammation afflicted the magicians as well as all the other Egyptians. But the Lord stiffened the heart of Pharaoh, and he would not heed them, just as the Lord had told Moses. So I think this is the first time, maybe not, but, but I, I think that we've had uh, you know Pharaoh hardening his heart, and here we have very explicitly... <clears throat> that God uh, is stiffening the heart of Pharaoh. God is the one sort of causing Pharaoh to be stubborn in a way. God is somehow constricting, restricting Pharaoh. And so this brings the question, and we ha we've had it already, because frankly, God sort of spills the beans early on what's going to happen here. But someone always brings up, well, what about Pharaoh's free will? You know, isn't this somehow oh, uh, interfering with Pharaoh's free will that God is hardening his heart, stiffening his heart, and not allowing Pharaoh to to repent? So, well, what do we what do we think about that? Well, Pharaoh's a bad guy; he wasn't allowed to repent. I'm still kind of unclear. Why is God making Pharaoh be stubborn? How does uh, that benefit? How does that benefit? Uh, so uh, the traditional explanation is that it benefits because God wants to measure out to Pharaoh and the Egyptians the full force sort of of the plagues. He wants to make sure they really get it. He wants to make sure they really understand mm -hmm. who's who and what's what. And it helps the Israelites because they just go, wow, God is awesome. God was able to do all this stuff to the Egyptians. God must really be God. And so we have those sort of mm. two uh, narratives. One is about giving the Egyptians their just desserts, uh, and the other is yeah. showing the Israelites that God is uh, awesome and God can do all this wonderful stuff. I, I, I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but it's kind of like uncomfortable. I want, I don't want God in that role. You know what I mean? Of saying, yeah. okay, I'm going to make him stubborn and I'll, and now I can really show him, but that's just me. Or it could oh, be an explanation. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't learn his lesson. Yeah, you yeah. know, so it's like maybe Pharaoh, uh, you know, maybe it's giving it a little, how would you put it? And then it's just after the fact, you know, to describe it. Yeah. You know, like one of the teachings I always, you know, have, um, have enjoyed, I guess, about this is that, you know, God isn't actually restricting Pharaoh in a way. God is just letting Pharaoh submit to his own nature. You know, mm -hmm. that, that because he is saying no all the time and being, you know, sort of who he is, being cruel, that God is not, is not going, God's going to let him be who he is, you know, and if he's going to yeah. be cruel, let him be cruel and get, and get punished. It's like sort of a, it borders on the, the gets their hurrah conversation, you know, that if you keep doing a bad thing over and over again, eventually it becomes less your choice to do it because uh, mm -hmm. you're almost addicted to the, uh, to, to the response. 
you know, and so you have choice in the beginning, but the more you do it, the more it just becomes a habit you're unable to break. And his cruelty is sort of that habit he can't break. Mm-hmm. And it feels it? like showing yeah. off, doesn't it? Sorry, Lou. It feels yeah, like that yeah. is showing off, you know, nanny, nanny, I'm stronger than you are, you know? Not sure for the nanny, nanny part, but, but, that, <laughs> but that being said, yeah, there's, I think, a little part of that as well. You know, God wants to, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right that God wants the show. God wants a display. God wants to leave no doubt. You know, God's running up the score. Uh, and, and just to let them know, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say who's the man. That sort of comes to mind. You know, who's the deity? You know, you tell me, you know, whatever it is. Uh, Leah, you had a question? No. So, so doesn't this, ex- God is um, forcing Pharaoh to expose himself and what his heart is like to his people, the ones that are left. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, they are the ones that are suffering rather than it looking bad for God. It looks bad for Pharaoh, for him to be like that. Yeah. Yeah, It's exposing who he is. A power, sort of a powerless tyrant, you know, who can't, uh, can't be of any help in this moment. Yeah. He can't be of help, him. and he, it's his choice to not just let the people go. Eventually, mm-hmm. we see that the uh, magician, magician priests begin to um, sort of turn away from him a bit and try to say, hey, look, you know, you got to stop it. You know, like, like this is over already. Like he's being undermined, uh, not only by God and Moses and Aaron, but eventually his advisors, like, you got to cut it out. You got to knock it off. Because what you're doing is not helping. It's not, you know, we're no, there's no win here. We've already lost. Uh, so let's maybe stop fighting. Because Do you think there's we could... no, no win here. Sorry. Do you think that we could get um, God to do the same thing to Putin? <laughs> Thought that was coming. Thought that was coming. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, maybe God will give him leprosy. Uh, we'll see. You know, uh... I always just think it's about the <laughs> To the extent that God got the ball rolling, it could all traces back to him. Mm-mm, yeah, the, the God sort of gets, the, gets it rolling here for Pharaoh. And just, uh, again, he's come this far. He's going to see it out to the end. And, of course, it doesn't end well for Pharaoh. Uh, and God willing, it might not end well in the other situation uh, for uh, some, some yeah. other folks. But I, I don't think a plague is coming just yet. Uh, Tyler, you like reading today? Sure. Something... The Lord said to Moses, early in the morning, present, early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go to worship me. For this time, I will spend all my plagues upon your person and your courtiers and your people in order that you may know that there is none like me in all the world. I could have stretched forth my hand and stricken you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been effaced from the earth. Nevertheless, I have spared you for this purpose in order to show you my power and in order that my fame may resound throughout the world. Yeah, so that sounds a little bit Mm. braggadocious, you know, know, certainly. And that sounds a little bit like, you know, uh, (laughs) follow me. Uh, you know, that I could have just killed you, you know, could have made it a quick death, but instead I'm going to drag this along. Uh, and so you're not going to die. You're going to live to, you know, see all this unpleasantness happen, uh, as well. God's a little tough, a little rough. Mm. You're sort of like mafia justice, you know, Hi, God Bob. is around. Old Testament God. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to watch you <laughs> suffer a bit more. Okay, but you know, here, uh, you know, God's God's not happy again. God's less than amused. The power you be a little more, yet you continue. yet you continue to thwart my people and do not let them go. This time tomorrow, I will rain down a very heavy hail, such as has not been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, order your livestock and everything you have in the open brook under shelter. Every man and beast that is found outside, not having been brought indoors, shall perish when the hail comes down no. on them. Oh, the hail is coming. The hail is coming. And they're giving forewarning. 
let's bring everything inside. You know, uh, it's going to be a rough day weather wise. Um, a special hail indeed. Now we're getting to Rabbi's favorite plague. I love this plague. This is on the top 10 list of plagues. This is my number one every year uh, because I think it's the most awesome out of the bunch. The laser light show that is the uh, the Pink Floyd uh, concert that is the 10 plagues. This is definitely the coolest one out of the bunch. Uh, Karen, go ahead. I'm missing a word here, but those among Pharaoh's courtiers who feared Adonai's word, I can't see the next one, brought, uh, brought their slaves and livestock indoors to safety. But those who paid he, uh, no regard to the word of Adonai left their slaves and livestock in the open. Adonai said to Moses, hold out your arm for the sky, oops, wait, this way, that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, upon human and beast and all the grasses of the field in the land of Egypt. So Moses held out his rod toward the sky, and Adonai sent thunder and hail and fire streamed down to the ground, as Adonai rained down upon rained down hail upon the land of Egypt. Whoa. It's just so awesome. It's fiery hail. It's not just hail. Hail would have been bad enough. The big chunks of ice falling on your head is not great, but the ice then explodes into flames, showing that God can subvert the laws of nature because hot and cold can't exist together, right? There's no thing as a fiery snowball in, yeah. you know, in real life. Only God can create fiery snow. Uh, and it just feels really like a Michael Bay movie kind of things where the asteroids are coming down. But here's big things, chunks of hail, and they blow up and it's fire. Fantastic. Just <laughs> that's what you get. That's what I didn't I watch the Ten Commandments long enough the other night to see that. It's there, it's there, it's hard, but it's, the graphics are worse uh, than the, the remake, you know, would have been, but fantastic. Sorry, we got to read more about the fiery hail. Go ahead, Karen. Oh, the hail was very heavy, fire very flashing heavy. in the midst of the something hail, such as had not fallen on the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hail struck down all that were in the open, both human and beast. The hail also struck down all the grasses of the field and shattered all the trees of the field. Only in the region of Goshen, where the Israelites were, there was no hail. I mean, it's in the middle of the hail. I and mean, that's the whole thing. It's fire encased in ice coming down to explode. You ever freeze a grape in the middle of some wine? You know, it's sort of like that. You know, you have like a little... Oh, it's good. No, you, you you freeze it first the night before. You can put it into your wine as an ice cube that melts, right. and you have the grape. So you know oh, it's all for the good. So anyway, but imagine that being fire. So we learned something too. A little culinary arts while we're here, <laughs> uh, as well. Freeze those grapes. It's good. Uh, but here we have some fiery ice. Just fantastic. Uh, as, I, as I said before, and I'll say again, I would have uh, folded my cards right about here, but Pharaoh's going to keep this going a little bit longer. Uh, Gary, you want to pick up here, thereupon? Okay. Thereupon, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I stand guilty this time. Adonai is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with Adonai that there may be an end of God's thunder and of hail. I will let you go. You need not stay longer. That's nice. It feels like we're at the end of the rainbow here that we can sort of get out of here uh, at this point in time. Of course, we know it's not going to work, but Pharaoh is duly chastened uh, by uh, hail fire. Uh, and he is uh, ready to let him go. He's had enough. Um, and so let's go, Gary, a little more. Moses said. Okay. okay. Moses said to him, as I go out of the city, I shall spread out my hands to Adonai. The thunder will cease and the hail will fall no more, so that you may know that the earth is Adonai's. But I know that you and your courtiers do not yet fear God Adonai. Yes, they don't feel the eternal God. They don't fear God just yet. So Moses isn't buying it. Moses is like, I've been down this road with you enough times. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to sink in a little negative moses you know and gotta be more optimistic maybe but uh but no he he's not optimistic on this so he's gonna have that good faith gesture of uh 
stopping all this fiery hail, hail and thunder. Uh, okay, Gary, give me now the flax. Okay. Now the flax and barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and flax was in bud, but the wheat and the emmer were not hurt, for they ripened late. Leaving Pharaoh, Moses went outside the city and spread out his hands to Adonai. The thunder and the hail ceased, and no rain came pouring down upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he became stubborn and reverted to his guilty ways, as did his courtiers. So Pharaoh's heart stiffened, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as Adonai had foretold through Moses. Ah, uh, so we're right back where we were. Uh, Pharaoh unbent, unbroken, unbowed. He is still... <laughs> Like how I flipped it? <laughs> I recognize it. You recognize it? Okay. Uh, what did... And, yeah. What, you know, yeah. the only one experiencing this. What about all the other people? What did they okay. think was happening? I, I, I would imagine that Pharaoh's approval rating was pretty low at this point in time. Uh, I, I don't think the people were loving this because uh, now how much of the average, you know, Joe Schmo Egyptian know about what was going on in terms of the reason that this is happening. Uh, but certainly the day-to-day the -day of the Egyptian uh, community was not so great. You know, one day it's frogs, one day it's, it's locusts, one day it's cattle disease and hail's flown on your head. You know, you have to sort of wonder what's going on, you know, who to blame for such things. So one can imagine imagine uh, Pharaoh was not ha having a great time. And would they, have, I mean, would they, have, well, I guess, I guess we wouldn't know, but I keep thinking about, you know, the people, the, the gods that they worshipped, and how did they, you know, wondered if they thought it had to do with their gods or something that they did. But, yeah, you know, they, they, they maybe could have thought they were having a bad, you know, a bad week, you know, maybe things weren't uh, doing as well as they were supposed to be doing in Egypt, and God, gods were punishing them. Uh, you know, to be sure, but Pharaoh in his role as Pharaoh was a deity, so uh, I, I think the people wouldn't be very happy uh, with their, their leader at this point in time, because what's the point of having a deity if you're getting destroyed? Which is, frankly, a very big theological question as well. Let's yeah. talk about it. You know, it's a question one has to answer, right? Uh, and, and so for, for the Egyptians, yeah, one can guess that they weren't having a great time. You know, it was not all fireworks and puppy dogs, at least not in a happy way. Uh, indeed, it was cattle disease and, you know, fiery hail. And frogs. Let's not forget the frogs. The frogs feel like such a lower on the totem pole of the, uh, the plagues, I got to tell you. Well, you I don't know, once you see this other stuff. like to have thousands of frogs. I mean, I not to preschool children, Rabbi. Right, right. <laughs> to the preschool well, like you, children, it's the the head of all of them. <laughs> as I'm saying, it's like, it, it's like when you really count the plagues up, you know, if you have to rank them from you know worst to best in terms of <laughs> at least how disruptive and, and painful on your life they were, the frogs are sort of you know a little easier to tolerate than you know boils. boils. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, yeah, and then you know, gonna, gonna get a little death later as well. So of course, you know, it's gonna. You know, be the uh, the last one here, the coup de gras. But uh, okay, so, foils. Up, then I don't know. I said, <clears throat> yeah, Sandy. I'm sorry. Yep. Then I, <clears throat> then I don't. I said to Moses, "Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his courtiers, in order that I may display these my signs among them." And that you may recount in the hearing of your child and of your child's child how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I displayed my signs among them, in order that you may know that I am Adonai. Indeed. So definitely, yeah, again, God being very clear the motivation here, right? Signs and wonders. Tell your children. Is he trying to convert <laughs> Uh, say again? Is he trying to convert the Egyptians? I was trying to convert them as much, uh, I, I, though we do have that mixed multitude that does come out with uh, with the Israelites. Uh, I think it's more that mockery and uh, chasing okay. them yeah. more than anything else. Um, yeah. 
you know, you, I think you also get and it's that, it's that mixture as we've been talking about of that, you know, when you talk to your parents or grandparents and they tell you, you know, I saw, you know, Babe Ruth play baseball kind of thing, you know, Mickey Mantle, uh, you know, you, you remember the greats, right? Uh, and uh, though we know from basically not even out of Exodus, you know, that this whole plan, at least, about causing the Israelites to have a sense of all wonder, majesty, reverence, you know, towards God, that it's a nice idea, but within a couple of chapters after we are out of the, uh, out of slavery, we're already trying to worship idols and, you know, create rebellion yeah. against most. So maybe the grand plan didn't work out exactly as envisioned. Uh, but that was, I think, part of it is to have people understand, you know, that God is God and God is the one who is, you know, the eternal and the one who is, uh, at least from the biblical perspective, you know, omnipotent and omniscient, right? That's sort of the vision of God they're creating, the one God who is more powerful, more mighty, more, you know, uh, <clears throat> more capable uh, than any other deity of creating science, wonders, and miracles, and of removing one people from the midst of another people that has never been done before in terms of uh, biblical history at any rate. Okay, Sandy, so Moses and Aaron. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, thus says Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may worship me. For if, you refuse, oh, I'm sorry. For if you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They shall devour the surviving remnant that was left to you after the hail, and they shall eat away all your trees that grow in the field. Moreover, they shall fill your palaces and the houses of all your courtiers and of all the Egyptians, something that neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have seen from the day they appeared on earth, on earth to this day. With that, he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Yeah, so, if, so earlier we have, you know, your children's children. Now you have your father's fathers. There's a nice sort of parallel. The children's yes. children are for the uh, Israelites, right? That you could tell your kids and grandkids all these signs and wonders. And here, here's warning Pharaoh. It's never happened before. You didn't see it. Your parents never saw it. Your grandparents never saw it. Once again, I'm not a bug person, so this would sort of do it. I mean, if I didn't have the the, the cards thrown in yet, this would do it for me. Uh, enough, I can't deal with this. You know, it's, the, the idea is locusts come, and there's so many of them that you can't even see in front of your face. So, so many bugs there are. Yeah, besides, yeah, you got to open your mouth instead of taking the protein. Yeah. Besides that, everything before was outside. It happened outside <laughs> the house, and he's saying this is going to be in your house. So yeah, you know, at your table and everything, it's all over you. That's, That's a oh, lot of crying from kids, etc. Yeah, it's going to be very unpleasant. And I, I do like that they mention also that you know anything that remained after I blew up all of your crops with the hail, bugs going to eat those now too. So whatever is left over, the bugs are going to take, uh, which is again a little mean spirited uh, in terms of at least that as a thing to say. Uh, things weren't bad enough. Here come the bugs. Release the bugs. <laughs> Release the bugs. It's terrible. Oh no, it's not going to end well. <laughs> and so, I always wondered, you know, um, you know, it's just like Moses turns and leaves. You would think Pharaoh, one of his, you know, goons, would have shish kebabed him by now. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the, the diplomatic immunity only goes so far. I feel like Moses is seen as an emissary. Like, that's great. But, you know, one wonders why Pharaoh wasn't like, you know, how about we kill this dude? Because this guy's not helping us. You know, a lot of problems here out of this guy. Um, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's a midrash somewhere about Pharaoh wanting to kill adult Moses. There's going to be a midrash about Pharaoh wanting to kill baby Moses. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I think that the Pharaoh might have needed to be a little more aggressive here. 
Don't, doesn't this also tell you how far Pharaoh was from his people? That they, yep. I mean, he was, he kept himself far from the people so that they couldn't go after him. Yeah. People at the top always do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, no, Pharaoh was going to be okay, you know, in, in his high, you know, high palace, so to speak, uh, his throne. But you would think Pharaoh could throw a few shekels at somebody, you know, and try to get an assassination done, you know, whatever it might be. But Moses was uh, was safe. He felt safe enough to go and do this uh, in front of Pharaoh. Um, and so, again, I'm not sure if there was it's probably a cultural taboo, uh, but Moses sort of came and went as he pleased, sort of as a soldier, you know, in, uh, in God's army here to let Pharaoh know that bad stuff is going to happen. And Pharaoh's like, okay, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see, I guess. And then bad stuff happens. And then Pharaoh goes, okay, this is terrible. Please stop. And then they stop. And Moses, how about another one? My next trick. My next trick. You know, we're going to have another problem. But here, as I said, so getting back to it, Pharaoh's, you know, uh, his group, his gang here, his cabinet, uh, are, are beginning to lose faith uh, in the situation and really want this to end. They have had enough. Uh, Barb, you want to pick up here Pharaoh's courtiers? Pharaoh's courtiers said to him, how long shall this one be a snare to us? Let a delegation go to worship their God, Adonai. Are you not yet aware that Egypt is lost? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go, worship your God, Adonai. Who are the ones to go? Okay, yes. Yeah. So Pharaoh's uh, you know, courtiers, assistants, you know, are there going, you know what? Let's end this. This is not, you know, there, there's no win here at this point. I'm just taking a beating. Uh, you know, this one, meaning Moses, is like a snare, is a trap. You know, he keeps coming in, you know, and bad stuff's happening and then it gets better and then it's bad again. You know, so we're just we're in this endless cycle and it's endless trap, you know, and we got to gnaw off the foot at this point. You know, we got to cut our losses and move on. So let them go. Let them go. Let them pray. Let them uh, you know, have the freedom because you know, we've already lost. That's the whole point is that it's this is part of the humiliation of pharaoh is that again if he's supposed to be the great one he's supposed to be the deity he can't see right in front of him not because of locusts uh but because he just can't understand the reality that he can't accept the uh his faith he can't uh, he doesn't he doesn't bring it in for himself he doesn't understand he can't make it real and so the quarter is like come on pharaoh you gotta stop you gotta stop this is over already Forget it, Pharaoh. It's Chinatown. Like, like this, this, this is done. Uh, but Pharaoh is still not there. Uh, even in this exchange, we're gonna see that uh, you know Pharaoh comes maybe a little closer, but he can't. He can't get there. Too much hate in his heart. Too much cruelty. He can't figure out how to escape this snare, escape this trap, which is is of his own making at this point. So who's gonna go? What does Moses say, Barbara? Moses replied, we will all go, regardless of social station. We will go with our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds, for we must observe Adonai's festival. But he said to them, Adonai be with you, the same as I mean to let your dependents go with you. Clearly you are bent on mischief. No, you must <laughs> go and worship Adonai since that is what you want. And they were expelled from Pharaoh's presence. <laughs> so here, Pharaoh gets to invent sarcasm uh, <laughs> in, in this one. It's fantastic. We never get sarcasm until Pharaoh. Uh, uh, so, you know, so we're going to go with the festival. So he says, sure, God be with you. I mean that as sincerely as I mean that I'm going to let you go. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. You know, he's not doing it. Uh, it means nothing to him. He, you know, he, he takes it back. He's being a little snarky. No, you're shirkers. Well, not, you're not shirkers here, but clearly you are bent on mischief. So if you and your brother want to go and a couple of your buddies want to go worship God, awesome. But that's all you get. Uh, and then Big Boot, you know, 
can get the manager here? Can we call security? Uh, and uh, Moses and Aaron are uh, gently, I'm sure, uh, escorted out of the palace uh, and from Pharaoh's presence. Uh, of course, you know, this does not bode well for Pharaoh and for Egypt because now we're getting the bugs. Uh, Leah, you want to pick up here? Then Adonai said. Then Adonai said to Moses, hold out your arm over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat up all the grasses in the land, whatever the hail has left. So Moses held out his rod over the land of Egypt and Adonai drove an east wind over the land all that day and all night. And when morning came, the east wind had brought the locusts. Ugh, unpleasant. Uh, so yes, now we're getting the locusts, that, that arms outstretched. Uh, and now the bugs are coming. Here, Leah, give me one more here to finish off the locusts. Need a little chocolate um, fountain. A little <laughs> fountain. The locusts. locusts invaded all the land of Egypt and settled <clears throat> within all the territory of Egypt in a thick mass. Never before had there been so many, <clears throat> nor will there ever be so many. They hid all the land from view, and the land was darkened. And they ate up all the grasses of the field and all the fruits of the trees, which the hail had left. So there was nothing, so nothing green was left of tree or grass of the field in all the land of Egypt. Yeah, that'll do it to you. Uh, I mean, this thick mass o bug uh, is quite a visual image, uh, just this wall of insects. Uh, and I love this line, never before, and there'll never be as many again. God's putting it down right then, you know, in, in human history, there'll never be as many bugs in one place as there were in Egypt. They, uh, can I ask yeah. a question? They, yeah. th it's really presented here as Egypt being very green and, you know, grass in the field, trees all around. Wasn't this the desert? They had green areas along the, the river. Along the Nile. Just yeah, like it is today. Yeah. Yeah. And when they would build the tombs and things, they were to build it out where the sand was, not where anything grew. Mm, so we got some irrig early irrigation. Did people live out, out, I mean, near near all the trees and everything? Or did they live, live out in the sand, in the desert? Well, I would think there'd be some people who would live in the sand, but in the, it's they were an agrarian society, so all the people would live where the the fields yeah, are, where, where their animals grew. are. Yeah, but they had a they had you a law. Hear your water supply. They had a law in Egypt that you couldn't build upon uh, the land where would that would be green because it was so vital to keep them going. You couldn't grow anything in the sand, so they did do what they could to protect the uh, fertile areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see a little, little agricultural history here. Very yeah. <laughs> I so learned something in school. <laughs> <laughs> that's why these, these early populations always had to settle by the water source, you know, because they have to farm, they have to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, uh, might have been a little bit more lush then uh, than it is today, depending on. But I guess the also the... Uh, Irrigation systems are better now as well. I've never been uh, to Egypt, haven't, haven't made it yet, uh, but it's on the list of uh, things to do. Uh, probably not my yarmulke. My leave the yarmulke. <laughs> those pyramids we built. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go see those pyramids. I had a friend of mine, you know, said, you know, there you go, you see the pyramids, you see the Sphinx. That's about it. And you go home. That's enough. You know, you don't need to do too much more. But that being said, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting things to do. Museums and, yeah. I don't know, the Cairo it's Opera it's Society. I'm doubtful. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. The Cairo Philharmonic. Like, I, don't, I don't know. But I'm, I'm sure there are things to do. And, you know, I like my hummus. It's fine. Uh, okay. okay. Pharaoh hurriedly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, 
I stand guilty before your God, Adonai, and before you. Forgive my offense just this once. Just this once. This guy's got to be outside his mind. Uh, and plead with your God, Adonai, if this death may be but removed from me. So he left Pharaoh's presence and pleaded with Adonai. Adonai caused a shift to a very strong west wind. So the east wind brings in the locusts, west wind takes out the locusts, which lifted the locusts and hurled them into the sea of reeds. I wouldn't want to swim in that water afterwards, but that's yeah. okay. Not a single locust remained in all the territory of Egypt, unless they were in the water. Uh, but Adonai stiffened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Oh, Pharaoh. Then Adonai said to Moses, hold out your arm towards the sky once more, that there may be darkness upon the land of Egypt, the darkness that can be touched. Creepy. Very creepy darkness. Uh, Moses held out his arm towards the sky, and a thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another, and for three days no one could move about. But all the Israelites, as you should know, enjoyed light in their dwellings. This thick darkness, also creepy. Um, not as bad as the bugs, uh, but creepy. And the sense of, like, the darkness you can touch. You know, like that, 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 there's like a certain quality of darkness when it's really pitch black. Uh, that is, I think, I will speak for myself, unsettling. Uh, you know, in those moments. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is uh, even worse than that. Uh, so it's overwhelming, all-encompassing darkness. A little rough. A little rough, I think. The Israelites have picks. Yeah, the Israelites have like you know their lighters, you know, in the air, and they have <laughs> you know candles and stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, this idea that like it was there's a, a, a metaphor for sort of desolation and loneliness like when, like when you're sort of enveloped in darkness from a psychological standpoint you know that's like a, if you're sunk in a deep despair depression you're sort of engulfed you know by this darkness uh, and so it's not just that physical oh it's dark outside I can't see I'm going to sleep for three days, uh, but it's all around you and sort of like a darkness that almost penetrates you uh, in, in a very uh, significant way, causing your whole body to sort of shiver and sort of feel overcome. So once again, it's like a really an, an intense darkness. It would be like being so isolated, you know, I kind of vision like, if, you know, if somebody who goes into, a, if you get to a cave and just the isolation even if each person has experienced that, how isolated people must have felt. Yeah, and, and, and like your eyes here, they don't adjust. You know, you're sort of stuck in it forever for those three days. <laughs> but yeah, it must have been really isolated. You can't really go anywhere. If you're just walking into the, your tent, walking into people and just stumbling and bumbling everywhere. So I think that's sort of stay where they were, sort of put in, in time out for a few days. We're almost there at the end of the plagues. Rick, give us a little more. Pharaoh then summoned. <clears throat> Pharaoh then summoned Moses and said, Go worship the Lord. Only your flocks and your herds shall be left behind. Even your children may go with you. But Moses said, You yourself must provide us with sacrifices and burnt offerings to offer up to the Lord our God. Our own livestock, too, shall go along with us. Not a hoof shall remain behind, for we must select from it for the worship of the Lord our God. And we shall not know with what we are to worship the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord stiffened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not agree to let them go. Pharaoh said to him, Be gone from me. Take care not to see me again, for the moment you look upon my face, you shall die. And Moses replied, you have spoken rightly. I shall not see your face again. Mm, okay, so now we're getting to the nitty and the gritty uh, right here. It's fantastic when you really think about it. Pharaoh says, okay, you know what? Fine, go leave. But, you know, you have to leave. Your, like Pharaoh still thinks he has some control here. Pharaoh still thinks he has some authority. And says, fine, you all can leave, but we're going to keep your flocks and your herds. Uh, you can take everything else, but you got to leave the cattle. Uh, and Moses said, no. Not only that, and then we're going to take our own livestock. We're going to take some of your livestock, too. You know, we're going to have to take all these animals with us. 
Um, and so uh, he's really not negotiating with Pharaoh really in any kind of good faith at this point. Moses has all the power, all the strength, and Pharaoh thinks he has power, but he's got nothing. He's got nothing going on. Uh, so you, the, now, he, of course, when you are faced with that kind of situation, he now abandons any kind of negotiating strategy and just sort of threatens him. Be gone. You know, uh, take care not to see me again, because if you see me again, I'm going to kill you, you know. And so, he, you know, it's very clear that, again, he's abandoned any kind of pretext of conversation, negotiation, diplomacy. He's not just resorting to threats and ultimatums because he's lost. Uh, and Moses sort of says, hey, you know what? I don't want to see your ugly face again anyway. You know, uh, that, uh, I'm done with you, you know. Maybe the next plague is your breath, Pharaoh, you know, sort of just, you know, <laughs> in his grill. Uh, and Moses sort of getting ready to turn on his heel and leaves. But Moses, of course, can't resist a little, a little parting shot. So this is sort of before he leaves. Uh, there's a little more to say because God's going to speak to Moses and Moses is going to speak to Pharaoh or really Aaron's going to speak to Pharaoh. Uh, Rick, give me one more. And I, I said to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring <clears throat> I will bring but one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. After that, he shall let you go from here. Indeed, when he lets you go, he will drive you out of here one and all. Tell the people to borrow each man from his neighbor and each woman from hers, objects of silver and gold. The Lord disposed the Egyptians favorably toward the people. Moreover, Moses himself was much esteemed in the land of Egypt among Pharaoh's courtiers and among the people. Yes, yeah, so the tide's turning, you know, here. Uh, you know, the, the Egyptians are looking at Moses more favorably because it's like, let's get out of here. Let, let's end this already. Uh, and the people are like, whatever you want, take what you want and get out, you know, because we've had enough of all of this at this point. Uh, but there's one more plague to go. Uh, Melissa, tell us all about it. Moses <clears throat> said, thus says the Lord, toward midnight I will go forth among the Egyptians, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl, who is behind the millstones, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And there shall be a loud cry in all the land of Egypt, such as has never been or will ever be again. But not a dog shall snarl at any of the Israelites, at man or beast, in order that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Then all these courtiers of yours shall come down to me and bow low to me, saying, Depart, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will depart. And he left Pharaoh's presence in hot anger. Not regular anger. <laughs> hot anger is different anger. Hot anger is particularly rough. Uh, I always like to mention that um, by char af, you know, it's the phrase that you get about anger. And it literally means your nose, the nose gets hot. When you're angry, you know, you get your reddened, so you're sort of, you know, your nose gets hot. So that's the euphemism for intense anger is that one's nose gets warm, gets hot. Um, and so midnight is going to be the time. Set your watches, folks. Uh, that's when every firstborn is going to die, uh, not only from Pharaoh's house, but, you know, of course, amongst the poor of the Egyptians, they're not exempt either. And yes, the cattle gets it too. Poor cattle. Uh, and there is never going to be a cry as loud as this uh, in Egypt because of all this death. Yet, dog's not going to look sideways at any Israelites. Uh, and that's going to show the distinction, right? And so, and when that happens, you're going to beg us to leave. You're gonna was, it the, was it the firstborn male or the firstborn? Firstborn male. So we were safe if we'd been in Egypt. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure you'd be having a great time. It wasn't exactly Disney World. <laughs> right, right. You would technically be safe, yes. Uh, I'm not sure how Twice progressive over. Might have been. Uh, Twice you over. You're female and Jewish. You were definitely safe. From man yeah. and beast. Man and beast. Everyone's getting it. You know. 
it's a little, you know, a little troubling, of course, you know, uh, and it's, you know, obviously there, there's the parallel, you know, between Pharaoh commanding it every, you know, Jewish male get thrown into the Nile, right? Every Jewish male, uh, Israelite male, you know, be executed, you know, upon birth to the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, you know, so there's an obvious sort of like bookending here of, uh, Pharaoh's decrees and what's going to happen, what's going to fall the Egyptians. This is Pharaoh's ruling, didn't exempt any Israelites. Uh, you know, God's judgment upon Pharaoh is not going to exclude any, uh, you know, firstborn Egyptian males, you know, whether they're rich, poor, or whatever it's going to be. Uh, social status doesn't matter. They're all going to get it. Uh, okay. Uh, Tyler, you want to pick up there? Sure. Now, now God had said. <clears throat> now the Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you in order that my marvels may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron had performed all these marvels before Pharaoh, but the Lord had stiffened the heart of Pharaoh so that he would not let the Israelites go from the, his land. Yes, yeah, so there's no, no backing out now. We've come too far. And now we get a little pause because now God is going to have a conversation uh, with Moses and Aaron. So it's like the bad stuff's coming, but we're going to build a little dramatic tension. Uh, we're going to just you know give it a little bit of space to breathe so we know uh, what's going to happen. So God's going to give a little soliloquy here uh, to explain to them, hey, this is how we're going to avoid this happening uh, to the Israelites. And let me tell you all about this cool new holiday you're going to have thanks to uh, this experience. Uh, so, Karen, you want to pick up here? Okay. Um, Adonai said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first of the months of the year for you. Speak to the community leadership of Israel and say that on the 10th of this month, each of them shall take a lamb to a family, a lamb to a household. But if the household is too small for a lamb, let it share one with a neighbor who dwells nearby. In proportion to the number, whoops, in proportion to the number of persons, you shall contribute for the lamb according to what each household will eat. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a yearling male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goat. You shall keep watch over it until the 14th day of this month. And all the assembled congregation of the Israelites shall slaughter it at twilight. Boy, that's oh, so I'll get a little Paschal lamb stuff going on. We have to have a Passover yeah. sacrifice. It really is a fascinating ritual, uh, you know, as it is explained. So first we get the idea that now we're going to have New Year's, right? We're going to have this shall mark for you the beginning of the months. Uh, it's the first of the months of the year, which is technically true. Rosh Hashanah is observed during the seventh month of the year. Uh, not the first month of the year, so they, right. that's a little bit of our a little interesting history there. For, uh, <laughs> yeah, for our yes, indeed. Uh, but now let's figure out this lamb. Okay, so you got to buy it early. You got to get to Joel's. You got to get the Publix a little early for your, all your Passover cookie. You can't buy it day of, uh, so you have to buy the lamb early. Uh, but if you are living by yourself, you know maybe just two of you, and you're a little older, you're not going to eat a whole lamb. You know, uh, I mean, that, that's a lot of meat eventually. So, you know what, you can share, but you all have to contribute, you know, uh, a little bit. So if you're going to have, you know, a leg of lamb, you know, quite literally, uh, that, that's going to cost you a little bit different. If you want to have the lamb uh, leg and maybe a little bit of shank, a little bit of breast meat, you know, uh, delicious, that's going to cost you a little bit more, right? And so uh, how are you going to carve this up? Um there is a financial component to it, which I think, again, is sort of nice. Everyone has to do it together. But if you're all going to eat a shekel's worth of meat, you don't have to pay for the whole thing. You know, so if you're feeling hungry, it's going to cost you a little bit more. Um, but if you're feeling a little bit, hey, a little bit of lamb's all you need, you don't pay that much. Uh, it has to be a lamb with a blemish, a yearling male. Getting hungry. Uh, so <laughs> take it from the sheep or the goats, and we're going to watch it. Uh, yeah, it's like a luau, you know, uh, but not a pig. Uh, so I've got to get the lamb. Get the lamb on the spit. That's the Greeks, right? The Greeks have usually the lamb on the spit. Good. 
I've never seen such a thing, uh, nor do I really have it on my list. I'll just have it, you know, at Publix, it's fine. Uh, I don't need to have the whole display. Uh, I don't need it. Um, okay, now we have the world's first mezuzah. Uh, and so now we're gonna have a little bit of our, of our mezuzah action here. Go ahead, Karen. Um, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they are to eat. That's a big mezuzah. They shall eat the flesh that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter mm. oh, We're ahead of it all. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in any way with water, but roast it. Head, legs, and entrails over the fire. You shall not leave any of it over until morning. If any of it is left until morning, you shall burn it. So no leftovers. Yeah, but you know, you can't stew it, you can't boil it, you can't poach it, you can't roast it, you can only roast it. That's the key. It has to be roasted over the fire. Uh, Getting old Julia Child on this, only when we're going to cook the lamb, you know, uh, it's got to be prepared a certain way. And you have some matzah and some bitter herbs, delicious. I'd be very happy with that on Friday. Uh, That'd be very nice. Um, I never make lamb for Passover. There's something about it that seems not right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick's all in for the lamb on Passover. He, yeah. he, he's I make the, pa- no brisket, I make the Paschal brisket. I don't know about the lamb. <laughs> the Paschal brisket. Uh, the brisket. That's mine. Yeah. But, but you see here, they have the blood, blood, uh, where they get to put it everywhere. Um, and it basically serves again as that identity marker, much like a mezuzah does, where you know this is an Israelite home, right? So God is going to pass over <coughs> the Israelites' houses because God is going to see, you know, the angel of death is going to see the marker. You know, the marker here is the lamb's blood. Um, oh. Then we're going to eat that uh, yummy, yummy lamb. Uh, Heads, legs, and again, leg of lamb you know about, but you know, I'm not sure how much you want to eat the lamb's face. Uh, but I'm sure that's, you know, people do that, but that's a little beyond me. Uh, and, and entrails as well. You know, a little kishka, you know, whatever it is. You know, back yeah. in the day, some stuffed derma. Uh, and so one can, you know, understand that. And there's something very, you know, like to consume the whole thing. Uh, but then you... Um, Whatever's left over, you burn it, you get rid of it, you know. See, again, like I, I had a whole fish recently, you know, because I like that. You know, you get those little snappers, you know, uh, from the Greek places, and you can have the fish. Then you can play with the, you know, the head. But you don't eat, I don't eat the head. I mean, people, yeah, uh, this doesn't work. So, yeah, but again, easier to eat the, the, the snapper than a whole lamb. So, you know, eating a whole lamb is going to be pretty, pretty too much to eat. So I'm not as interested. The Haggadah talks about seeing matzah because they left Egypt in such a hurry that the yes. bread never rises yeah. and it's flat, you know, cracker. But here it's actually saying, you know, before they even leave, leave, uh, leave Egypt, they're supposed to have matzah. This goes back to what we said before, though, about explaining it afterwards, afterwards. because we're going to get the whole they rushed out of Egypt every time to the bread to rise. It's going to be in the next chapter or two. That, that, that is going to be in there. But we have it here first. So God is sort of telling them in the future, you know, what's going to happen through the meal because of. Exactly because that, that we did. Knows, yes. You know, so all this is going to be in play earlier. Um, and um, it, it should be noted, you know, it's a different class, but I'll, I'll mention it uh, here, is that the Seder, you know, uh, as we have it develops over the centuries, right? From a biblical standpoint, you know, we don't have too much of the Seder here. We have some of it. You know, we have the, the lamb, you know, we have the unleavened bread, we have the bitter herbs, right? But a lot of the other elements of the Seder come throughout history, some happening, you know, sort of in the Talmudic period. And so when your friends say, oh, I think of Jesus's last supper was a Seder, no. It really wasn't because there was no Seder yet, or at least, you know, one that was as complex as one that we have today. Did he have a lamb chopping some matzah for the last supper? I don't know. He might have, you know, but uh, there really is no evidence to say that his last meal was actually the last supper. Uh, I mean, sorry, the Seder was the last supper. Uh, There's no 
real documentary proof of that or, or whatever. Uh, and again, so not what we do today. So when the Christian community says, let's have a Seder just like Jesus, you know, I can throw some like lamb's blood at them, you know, and, you know, have some matzah. But it, like, I don't think they'd appreciate it so much. So that's not how you build interfaith relationships, uh, which I do cherish. So we do not have Christian satyrs uh, for that reason. Uh, with that said, my friends, it is 8.03. It went into a little overtime today uh, because we need to talk about, you know, lamb's blood and all that other good stuff. Uh, but it's great to have you all here as always. Have a Zeeson Pesach. Uh, enjoy. We will have class next week. You know, we are not uh, taking a break for Passover. So we will be here with our matzah and tuna fish salad. Uh, that would be very nice. Uh, enjoy your Seder, and I'll see you all sooner than later, okay? See you Thank Friday you. night. Thank you. Happy Passover. Thank you, see you.